An indefinite integral has no fixed limits between which it is evaluated. An example is the integral of cosine x dx, which evaluates to sine x plus a constant of integration. The result is symbolic, not numeric, and there is always a constant of integration. A definite integral is evaluated between two fixed points. An example is the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine x dx, which is equal to 0 0.8415. The result is numeric, and it can be interpreted as the net area between the function and the x-axis from 0 to 1. There is also no constant of integration. An improper integral is one that has limits of integration containing infinity. An example is the integral from 0 to infinity of the Gaussian function e to the minus x squared dx. Improper integrals like this are defined in terms of a limiting process that replaces infinity in the integral with some variable, such as b in this case, and takes the limit of the integral as the variable goes to infinity. In this case, the result is the square root of pi over 2. In this microlecture, we want to use knowledge of how to evaluate indefinite integrals to evaluate definite and improper integrals. Before we do that, we need to familiarize ourselves with some properties of definite integrals. One property is that the integral from a to b of the function f of x can be written as the sum of two integrals, one from point a to point c between points a and b, plus the integral from that intermediate point c to the point b. This can be illustrated graphically with the function sine of 0.08x squared plus 2. The integral of this function between the points a and b is the area between the curve and the x-axis from a to b. This same area can be obtained by breaking the integral into two portions, one that goes from a to c and one that goes from c to b. The point c can be anywhere between points a and b. The sum of the two areas still adds up to the area between a and b. Another property is that the integral from point a to point b of some function f of x is the negative of the integral with the limits reversed, going from b to a instead of from a to b. This can be understood by remembering that the area under a curve is defined as the sum of the area of n rectangles, expressed as the height of each rectangle times the width of each rectangle, in the limit of the number of rectangles going to infinity. The width of a given rectangle, delta x sub j, is defined as the x-coordinate of the edge of the rectangle encountered second, x sub j, minus the x-coordinate of the edge encountered first, x sub j minus 1. The subscript j minus 1 indicates that the x-coordinate comes before x sub j. When integrating from left to right, from a to b, we start counting j from the left side of the plot, and so x sub j is the right side of each rectangle, while x sub j minus 1 is the left side. Thus, x sub j is always greater than x sub j minus 1, making the width of each rectangle positive. When integrating from right to left, from b to a, we start counting j from the right side of the plot, and so x sub j is the left side of each rectangle, while x sub j minus 1 is the right side. This means that x sub j is always less than x sub j minus 1, making the width of each rectangle negative. This is why changing the direction of integration from left to right to right to left changes the sign of the integral. Let's move on to how we evaluate a definite integral using an indefinite integral as the starting point. The fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that the result of the integral from a to some point x of the function f of u du is itself a function of x that we call capital F of x. This is the definition of an indefinite integral and defines an integral as an antiderivative, symbolized as capital F of x. Another microlecture shows you how to evaluate these. Let's imagine that the indefinite upper limit of integration is some value alpha such that we evaluate the integral from a to alpha of f of u. The result is capital F evaluated at alpha, which is the indefinite integral evaluated at alpha. Imagine further that x is set equal to a different value called beta, such that we integrate from a to beta. The result of this is capital F evaluated at beta. Again, this is the indefinite integral evaluated at beta. Taking the difference f at beta minus f at alpha is the integral from a to beta of f of u du minus the integral from a to alpha of f of u du. Leaving the left side and the first term on the right of the equal sign the same, we use one of the properties of definite integrals to change the order of integration in the second term after the equal sign to give plus the integral from alpha to a of f of u du. We can write the sum of integrals on the right in the other order to obtain capital F at beta minus capital F at alpha equals the integral from alpha to a of f of u du plus the integral from a to beta of f of u du. Using another property of definite integrals, we can combine these into one integral because the limit a is an intermediate value between alpha and beta. This gives f at beta minus f at alpha equal to the integral from alpha to beta of f of u du. This result provides a way to evaluate a definite integral between two limits of integration. First, evaluate the indefinite integral. Next, evaluate the indefinite integral at the bounds of integration and take the difference in the results. 
An example might help make this more clear. Let's say we want to evaluate the integral from pi over 4 to pi over 2 of cosine x dx. The rule we have just derived says that we should first evaluate the antiderivative of cosine x, which we know is sine x. To keep track of the limits of integration, we usually write the indefinite integral in brackets and place the limits of integration on the right side. We then interpret this to be the indefinite integral evaluated at the upper limit minus the indefinite integral evaluated at the lower limit. This gives 1 minus 1 over the square root of 2, which has the decimal value of 0 0.293. This applies for any method of integration. An example using substitution is the integral from 0 to 2 of x cosine of x squared plus 1 dx. To evaluate this definite integral, we need to first evaluate the indefinite integral, and that is made much easier by using substitution. Let's set the variable u equal to x squared plus 1, the argument of the cosine function. The derivative of u with respect to x is 2x. Solving for du gives 2x dx. The product x dx is in the original integrand, and so we want to solve for that. Dividing both sides by 2 gives 1 half du equal to x dx. In the original integrand, we can now replace x squared plus 1 with u to give cosine of u, and we can replace x dx with 1 half du to give 1 half du. Of course, this is still an integral, but because we have carried out substitution, the bounds of integration are not the same, and we do not yet know what they are. To find the new bounds of integration for u, we plug the original bounds of integration for x into u equals x squared plus 1. Plugging in the lower bound of x equals 0 gives u equal to 1. Plugging in the upper bound of x equal to 2 gives u equal to 5. The integral can now be written as 1 half the integral from 1 to 5 of cosine u du. Evaluating this indefinite integral gives 1 half sine u evaluated from 1 to 5. The result is 1 half times the quantity of the indefinite integral evaluated at the upper bound minus the indefinite integral evaluated at the lower bound. The decimal result is negative 0.9. Always be careful with the bounds of integration when using substitution. Evaluating an improper integral is similar except that a limit must be used whenever infinity is involved. Consider the integral from 0 to infinity of x times e to the minus x squared dx. This integral can be evaluated using substitution by setting u equal to x squared. The derivative of u with respect to x is 2x. Solving for x dx gives 1 half du equal to x dx. Rewriting the original integral using these quantities gives the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u times 1 half du, where the 1 half has been taken to the front of the integral. Note that in this case, the bounds of integration are the same as before, and this may not always be the case. This integral is minus 1 half e to the minus u evaluated from 0 to infinity. Substituting x squared back in for u gives minus 1 half e to the minus x squared evaluated from 0 to infinity. Normally, we would plug in the bounds of integration to this result and find the difference in value, but when infinity is involved, we have to take the indefinite integral and evaluate its limit as x goes to the upper bound of integration, which is infinity. We then subtract the indefinite integral evaluated at the lower bound of integration, 0, which requires no limit to be taken. The limit of e to the minus x squared as x goes to infinity is 0, and then we add the value of the second term, which is 1 half, and the integral therefore evaluates to 1 half. Not all improper integrals can be evaluated in this manner. Some can only be evaluated numerically, in which case it is better to use software or to look up the result in a table of integrals. Even when the improper integral can be evaluated in this manner, it is sometimes just faster to look up the known result in a table of integrals. And that's evaluating definite integrals.